Welcome to the Pathways to Success. I'm Julian Placino, recruiting professional turned success speaker, show host, and media entrepreneur. This show is dedicated to helping you find your unique pathway to success by having conversations that educate, inspire, and transform. Together, we'll interview some of the world's greatest leaders and uncover their secrets to success. Thanks for tuning in and on to the show. Welcome to episode 201 of the Pathways to Success, where we have conversations with the world's greatest leaders. I'm Julian Placino, your host, and we have an outstanding show for you today. Today's episode is sponsored by City Central. City Central offers innovative workspaces for your business to thrive. City Central offers everything from private offices and co-working space to virtual offices and meeting rooms. City Central has five convenient locations in DFW, including North Dallas, Plano, Uptown, Richardson, and Fort Worth. If you use the promo code PATHWAYS, you'll get 50% off your first three months. So if you are looking for an innovative workspace for your business to thrive, check out citycentral.com for a free tour and use the promo code PATHWAYS to get 50% off your first three months. So before we introduce our featured guests, I have to give a huge shout out to everyone here tuned into the live stream. As always, if you have any questions for our featured guests, feel free to submit them. We'll answer as many questions as we can in the time that we have. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the Pathways to Success, nationally renowned restaurateur and author of The Mad Entrepreneur, Phil Romano. Phil, welcome back to the Pathways to Success. How are you, sir? Good, thank you. It's great to have you back. How are things going? Oh, pretty good, I think. I'm still here. <laughs> still here. You know, in preparation for the conversation, I was looking back at our history, and I met you in 2018 at the Network Bar. You were on a panel with Jennifer Sampson from the United Way, and I was emceeing the event right, right. for the Social Venture Partners of Dallas. And since then, we've been able to sort of work in each other's networks, and it's just been a true pleasure to know you. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Phil, much of our audience knows exactly who you are, but I sort of want to restate the magnitude of your career before we jump into this, right? So you've been in the industry for over 50 years. You've created 25 concepts with six of them national concepts, including Fuddruckers, Romano's Macaroni Grill, Spaghetti's, Cozumel's, Rudy, Rudy's Country Store and Barbecue, E.T.'s Market and Bakery, and you currently own and operate E.T.'s Market and Bakery, Nick and Sam's Steak and Fish House, Nick and Sam's Grill, and of course, Cole Vine's Pizza. And I say this because it goes without saying that you've had a tremendous career in the restaurant industry. But 2020, as you know, arguably has hit the restaurant industry harder than anyone else out there. So I'm curious, share with us what have been your experiences, observations, lessons learned, anything like that? <clears throat> well, over the years, the industry has changed, still changing, mm -hmm. and, and some things have brought about changed a little faster and a little different mm -hmm. in this last year or so. But our industry has been adapting and adjusting all the while. We've got problems, we adjust, we adapt, and so forth. So we got to do the same thing now. We got to look at the problems out there. We got to figure out how to get around them. We got to adjust and adapt. It's like, well, it's like, for example trying to get employees mm -hmm. you know what are we doing what do we do what do we have to do it's different today before people be dying to get a job now you got to die to get them to get a job mm -hmm. you know it's just not the same anymore it's just hard and uh, I got a concept now I'm ready to open up at uh, the art park I think you will talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit yeah. down in Trinity Groves and we're ready to go but we can't open up we don't have people so we try to adapt and adjust we try to go with technology Okay, we, we try to get, you know, this one dine and different things you're trying to incorporate into it. But it doesn't, it, it, it's conf to me it's confusing. Mm -hmm. I, made my, I made my charge in the industry without technology. For me to bring technology in now, it's confusing to me. And if it's confusing to me, I think it's going to be confusing to the general public too. Although it's a different, different public out there now. Mm -hmm. And they're all tech sau suave and all that. I'm not. I never had a chance to, to learn it because I... I was too busy doing things, but I hired people to do it. Now I can't even speak their language, you know, yeah. with this. So we're trying to come up with innovative ways where we could cut back and cut down on, on employees. 
And I think they're shooting themselves in the foot when they all these employees and the demands they're making and what they're doing because industries are going to find out a way and how to do it out of them. You know, it's like they don't need them anymore. Like McDonald's is doing it. I'm just reading about McDonald's out there. They got it now where they you be talking to a computer, everything. Maybe one or two people just running the whole place. And uh, get in there, everything's done without, without employees. Very, very few employees get it down almost nothing. And uh, they see that that's happening and it's, and it's going to take off. People start doing that. But uh, there's always two or three different kinds of restaurants. Mm -hmm. There's fast food, which is going to suffer the most. Because the people in fast food don't, you know, they don't make that kind of salary or that tips or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And But they're there. They're necessary. It's probably the first job that a lot of kids had when they get out of high school or when they're in high school. They learn, you know, and, and, which is good. they got to have a job. they got to learn, you know, a responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to disappear. You know, they're not going to have that opportunity anymore. But the other, the other thing that I see happening is, is places like, uh, you know, the other thing is, is casual dining, a lot of casual dining restaurants. There's fast food, casual dining, there's dining, okay, and casual dining they, they go to on a, almost three or four times a week, you know, going out at nighttime maybe mm -hmm. four or five times a week. And then there's dining, you go, you go to dining when, when you could afford it or on an occasion. That's the smaller market. But to get employees, it's easy to get employees on a fine dining, especially if you got one that's successful. Right. Already successful. Like Nick and Sam's. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just we just doing so much business there. It's unreal. And and it's been that way. People want a place to go out, and if even if, if money's a problem, they they don't want to waste their money someplace else. They want to spend their money on something that's they know it's good. A steakhouse. Mm -hmm. Go to a steak. Buy a steak. I'd rather spend you know fifteen dollars or twenty five dollars on a steak than you know. Five dollars on something I don't I don't want to eat, so you know they're they're going to be successful, and so with the waitresses and waiters. Now fine dining, I guess some of my waiters making one hundred and fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes. I mean it, it's amazing, and they're 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 happy as a lark. They're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's almost a stepping stone. It's, it's easy for us to get employees in there because they it's a everybody wants to hire somebody that's worked at Nick and Sam's. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a, it's a come on to it's them. A reputation. Too. Yeah, so it works. It works for us. And, and the casual dining, it's like the chilies and, and, and that type of, those type of places. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, to me, they've always gotten blurry. They're all the same. I could blindfold you and bring in one. You wouldn't tell me which one. You couldn't tell me which one it was at. Mm -hmm. All the same kind of food, same kind of jargon from the waiters and waitresses, the same kind of music playing. Everything's the same. You know, and I think to be successful in the restaurant business, you got to have a point of difference. Right. You got to have a point of difference. You got to be different than all the other restaurants around you. If there's five restaurants in a block and four of them are doing business, and four of them aren't doing any business, they're just not doing it. One's doing all the business. That guy must be doing something different. Right. He must have a point of difference. He's not doing something that they're doing. You got every time you do something, it's got to have a point of difference. The way it looks, the way it acts, what it does, everything. It's got to, it's got to get that. It's got to make that part of the brand when you're when you're going with it. But if the industry is, um, it's complex. It's not not as cut and dry as it used to be. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's issues. But I think the industry has been around long enough to be able to come up with solutions and work around it. So I'm curious, back to the talent piece, the reason why is, you know, deeply that's a topic that I like to talk about because I come from recruiting, but whether it's restaurants or technology or professional services, across the board, people can't seem to find talent. So I'm curious, what are some of the things that you have done differently to try to attract talent that seems to be working? Well, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get people to come back to work. Yeah. Especially when they can't make as much money as they're making, not going to work. Sure. So mm -hmm. that's the big issue. Right. And that's that's what's that caused by? It's caused by our leaders, mm -hmm. our leadership, you no, know, the government, the government doing something like that. Yeah. And it's uh, it's hurting small entrepreneurial places. And the big places, well, they'll, they'll get by. They'll, but the small places are bad. And I will tell you what, it's bad because our economy and our our velocity of small businesses being open, 
is what makes our economy what it is today. And that's going to dissipate because if I got, if I got a business, I'm starting it off, it's going good, and then this happens, knocks me down, yeah. then my first place, I can't afford to try it again. Mm -hmm. I just took my lickings. I'm going to say goodbye. I'm getting some another industry. So we're going to lose a lot of people, yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs. Because really, when you think about it, the rest of the industry is, is a very easy business to get into. You know, I cook, get some tables, get a chef, tablecloths, get light up, open up, get a license, and you're in business. If you're good, you survive. If you're not good, you're not going to survive. Mm -hmm. But now they make it so even if you're good, you have a hard time surviving. So you're going to see a lot of decline in, the, in that industry. Yeah. But to do, what do I do? Well, we do? We try to we try to go to a different market. We try to go to a market that's not being affected by the giveaways. Interesting. Okay. Young kids, first job out of out of high school or in college, they're not working for anybody, so not they can't get the PPP and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So they 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 want a job. They got to work. But something's coming on now that they want to come in, but they don't want to work for. Minimum wage, or not minimum, but ten, fifteen dollars. They want thirty dollars an hour. Wow. You know, and I don't think the industry is going to sit back and do that very long. Wow. You mentioned that um, you're thinking about opportunities to scale back on on talent. Like, what does that look like for the future of your restaurants? I guess. What does the experience look like for the for the customer? Well, different type of restaurants. Okay. Sure. Fast food. There's going to be a lot of innovation. Gotcha. A lot of technology. A lot of self serve. A lot of going. You know. You're doing the work, mm -hmm. the customer, and the, right. the um, casual dining. I think that it's going to be somewhat animated. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the, the takeout and all that stuff happening. Right. You know, because people again, just, they got used to just not going out, mm -hmm. staying home, watching TV, Netflix, and all that kind of stuff, and want something not fast food, but want a casual meal at home. That's going to affect, and that's going to do good, but it's going to affect the out, out dining. And then you got fancy places. If they're good, they're going to do business and they'll keep on doing business. Right. People are gregarious. They want to get out. They want to beat other people. Mm -hmm. They want to eat. They want to see this, see and be seen, new clothes, the whole thing, and, and the right kind of people. And that's what we got. That's Nick and Sands. We, yeah. we, sell, we sell more than just food. We sell that energy and that, that right. charisma and that, all that kind of stuff for it. And that's what people thrive. I mean, we've opened up and we never really had hit way, way down. We've always been able to stay open, mm -hmm. and now we're doing more business than we did pre-COVID. That's awesome. It's unreal. I mean, it's, 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 so we're, you know, it, it, it depends on the type of a restaurant you are, the kind of innovation, the kind of things you have to do. Right. You know, Rosie and I, we went to Nick and Sam's pretty recently, and it was an incredible experience, and everything that you're saying was what we had experienced as well. So I guess I'm curious, again, from a talent standpoint, what do you think Nick and Sam's is doing right to attract that high-level talent? What, I'm so, so what do you think Nick and Sam's is doing right from a recruiting perspective oh, to attract okay. the right people to come work for you? Well, it's our it's our history. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh, all these waiters are there making good money. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't want to leave. We don't we don't have very much turnover to waiters unless we turn them over. Okay. You no, know, they're not doing up meeting up to our standards. Out they go. You know, and we replace them. So we're always people wanting to come work for us. They're waiting in line to work for us. Mm -hmm. We got a training program they got to do. Certain things we got to do, and you know. When you bring an employee in, I think the more rules and regulations they got to follow, I think the more comfortable they feel because they know they got, they're working for a, a company that, that wants to do things right. Mm -hmm. To do things right, you got to make up the rules and regulations. Right. And we do that, and, and we adhere by it. You know, they don't do it. They're out. They're gone. Somebody's doing something wrong. They don't last very long because you know, everybody bitches about them and all the other employees, and they're gone. Is there anything you're doing unique in your interview process that helps create sort of the right sort of person to come work for you from your staff that other restaurants may not be doing? I don't know. I think people, when they come interview with you, they know who you are. Yeah. They know what you've done. They know, you know, what your restaurant is all about. Or else they wouldn't come to you. Mm -hmm. And it's people that, that don't have any experience and aren't there, they won't come to us to interview. They, you know, they're wasting their time. Yeah. You know, if they're professional, they look good, they are good, got a good job, good references, the whole thing. We bring them in, and but we train them. We do them our way, which is, uh, and we spend a lot of time on, uh, on, on training. Gotcha. So, Phil, before we take our commercial break here, I know you wanted to talk about the art park 
What is that, and, and what can we know about that right now? Well, the art park is in um, Trinity Grove, a project in Trinity Grove. Okay. The incubator we did down there mm -hmm. is going well. But we had a, a big parking lot out in front, you know, between the restaurants and, and the uh, Singleton. Mm -hmm. And we put, a, put maybe 40 more trees in there. We put um, a big high 12-foot fence around the whole thing, wooden. And inside the fence, we got, you know, nothing but graffiti. Yeah. Went down the street, got all the graffiti guys to come down and put all the graffiti in it. Then we got sculptures from all the, this is West Dallas art. We got all the sculptures down there and all the stuff. They can't, they got their sculptures, they got them in their yards. They can't sell them, nobody's going by and seeing it. So I let them put them in the park. Mm -hmm. Now we got all these nice sculptures. I mean, nice sculptures. You know, they're there, you know, we got them all lit up and all that. And we got them there. We got tables and chairs and with umbrellas and we got, you know, uh, fire pits that, you know, in the summertime we put the, uh, uh, top over it, make a table out of it. Yeah. So we went in the winter time, take the top off, and get the fires going. We got all that going. We got um, you know music. We got TVs. I think we got almost 20 TVs in a place. Mm -hmm. Big TVs all the way around. Put up there. So you know football season comes and all that's happening for that and all the sports and so forth and so on and and, and on. so it's uh, and, and we got uh, we put containers out there with uh, uh, for our bars. Mm -hmm. we got, we're going to have. Um, all mixed drinks, and they had frozen drinks, a bunch of frozen drinks up there, and we. And, uh, so it's um, it's going to be a, a pretty, pretty. Much. We took a place out there that used to be there, off-site kitchens. Uh -huh. We took that, and Nick, Nick, you know, was overloaded, wanted to get rid of that, so we let him go, go leave, and we took that over, and we're going to put a place out there too, which was ready to open up, and um, so it'll be, it'll be neat and different. In fact, we're even figuring about. How are we going to get these people to, to get their food? Mm -hmm. They come in there to eat. They want to eat. And uh, we'll serve all the booze down there. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll take care of the booze. You know, individual, go get that. We'll have probably servers taking care of the, 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 uh, the food, the liquor. But all the food, just, you know, we gotta, you can go up to all the restaurants if you want to. It's all there for you. Okay, and, and we're looking at one company called One Dine, but I don't think they're going to be able to get their technology up so it's going to work for us, so we may not do them. Um, but there's, um, you know, it's a pretty exciting concept. I mean, I just did an interview today with CBS, mm -hmm. uh, down at 4 o'clock today, 5 o'clock today. Um, and it's, um, it, it's, going, it's different. It's really got a point of difference. You know, it's like um, Katy Trail Ice House, but right. there's something out there besides just picnic tables, you know. There's art. You know, there's all that kind of stuff happening in the right kind of music, art, more TVs. But um, we're, we're excited about it. We think it's going to hit the market. It's, it's ready. People want that, mm -hmm. especially with all this outside dining. They don't want to eat inside anymore. They want to be outside. Well, they could be outside. Bring your dogs. That you sounds know. like an incredible outdoor premier experience. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. There's a lot of them around Dallas. Um, we're not the first, you know, but what we're trying to do it, do it better than anybody else has. Mm -hmm. You know, so we got a lot of places we look at to make sure we're better than they are. And when can we expect to see this come into fruition? When is it launched? Well, we're ready to open up as soon as we get the people. Okay, so that's what it is. It's all the talent. Not the customers, but employees. <laughs> yeah, right. Gotcha. Okay. So, Phil, we're going to take a quick commercial break to hear from our sponsors. You want to transition out of your career and do something tech related. Code Up is the place for you. When I came to Code Up, I was actually working at a chain hair salon. It was just starting not to be for me anymore. Um, my goals were to never work a weekend ever again, to have full health care and benefits, and to just have more time with my son. And now I've met all of those goals. I don't have any regrets. I just regret not coming sooner when I saw those billboards and I was driving down the highway.
and we're back with Phil Romano. Phil, before we jump into Keys to Success, I have a small gift here for you from our friends, courtesy of Dead Soxie. And this is kind of weird because, Phil, I know you don't wear socks, right? <laughs> what is the story behind that? Okay, you got it. Good. Good. So this is a limited edition Dead Soxy sock, courtesy of our friends at Dead Soxy for you. Well, thank you. Coming back on the show. Thank you very much. Good. So, Phil, I want to jump right into the book. Of course, this is uh, something you launched in 2019, and it really talks about like your ideas about success. And I'll be very honest with you, I'm about three-fourths of the way through the book. And I know one thing you're very passionate about speaking on is this idea of discovering and living your values. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think everybody has to have a value system. Mm -hmm. A business has to have a value system. In fact, uh, my son... Uh, his name is Sam. He's, he, uh, Who's in studio with he, us today. He's right there. He's sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, gave him his, I gave him his value system when he was um, in, in grade school. Yeah. I used to drive him to school every morning. That's my job. Right. Drive him to school, and I'd tell him, okay, Sam, there's, there's five things you got to have to be a good person. You know, it's called a value system, okay? Here's what you got to have. Number one, you got to have principles. Mm -hmm. We talk about principles, and principles are sticking to your deal, doing what you said you are going to do. Number two was responsibility. You got to be responsible. You got to be responsible for making the right choices. Okay, responsible to making it work. Responsible for taking the repercussions if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number three, you got to have integrity. You got to be honest. You got to tell the truth and be honest, and you don't lie and don't lie to yourself. Number four, you got to communicate. Okay, you got to take and you got to tell people how you feel. Don't let them tell you how you should feel. You express yourself. Be a leader. Say what you want and say what you are and say what you want to be. Number five has three things in it. Okay, it has God, I believe in God, patriotism, love of our country, mm -hmm. and five, next, you got to have charity. So that's, that's your value system. So you, you adhere to it. That's that's basically what you what you live by, and you take a business. The business has to have the same principles, the same the value, same value system, right? It has to have say what you, know, you know, stick to those principles. Say what you were, be what you were. Yeah. Stick to your deal. Responsible, responsible for making sure it's, a, it's done right. The public is happy with what you're doing, not killing anybody or poisoning anybody. Whatever you're doing. You got to be honest and truthful with your, with your promotion, your advertisements, and what are you doing? And number th four, you got to communicate your message, of what you are. Don't let them tell you what you should be. You be what you are, what you want to be. And then same thing. Got concepts. Got to believe in God. Got to you know. It's got a charity. It's got to have patriotism. You know, you do that for business. You do that for you individually, and for an individual, and, and you go forward with it. And I, <laughs> with my son, it's in my book too. Uh, I even made a um, org chart, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's uh, it's like an organizational chart for success, yes, right? That's yes. something that Sam yeah. lives very by. Very top, very top. <laughs> then it yeah. goes across. The very top is is your health. Without your health, you can't have anything. Uh -huh. So your health is very important. You don't, you know, to come down the next one over there. Your parents, get your parents there, and it tells you all the things your parents are supposed to provide for you mm -hmm. or help you with. The next is your education. You know what your what you do, what your education is going to bring you and do for you. Next is is your girlfriend, relationships. What's that going to do for you? Mm -hmm. All the way on down. The next is, is um, athletics. What's the athletics going to do for you? you know, keep you in shape, keep you healthy, getting that, get you in college and all that kind of stuff. And far over, that's one is friends. What are they going to do for you? Give you just your social business, your mm -hmm. social, your world that you're going to exist in, people you're going to go to college with, you're going to be in business with, you're going to be friends with, you're networking and all that stuff there. And that, that's, your, that's your org chart. And then when you, that, that'll get you out of, out of college. And when you get out of college, it, it goes up the whole, the, whole, the whole deal. But it's, uh, you know, you need some guidance, some look at what you're doing mm -hmm. and going forward. So we, that's, that's a value system that, that I used on my son. I use it on myself. Mm -hmm. My businesses, they all have that. I remember when we spoke last, I asked you of the six national concepts, because how many did you come up with total? Because there was way more than 25, right? 
I don't know. But the commonality that I asked you for is like, Phil, if there was one thing that tied together all of the successful national concepts, what was it? And you said it was their bill of rights. It was their sort of, it was their value set that made them successful, right? Yes. So that, mm -hmm. that and another important thing too is that and what they did. What they did. Yes. What they what they did. In other words, um, it had to serve a purpose. Right. It had to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. You want to be an entrepreneur. You want to be a businessman. All you got to do is come up with a solution for a problem. Can it? And sell it to that industry that, that has that problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I give a lot of talks at universities and colleges, and kids raise their hands. Hey, I want to become an entrepreneur. How do I do that? I said, Well, graduate from college, get a job in an industry that you think you'd like. Understand it, learn it, understand the things that are plaguing it, mm -hmm. that are hardships in it, come up with solutions for those, and sell it to the industry. You're an entrepreneur. But you got to solve problems. That's all, that's all being creative is. Yeah. If you're creative, you got to come up with a, a creative way to, to solve a problem. I don't care if it's opening a, a can of beans. You know, you got to have a, a, a unique way of opening up cans of beans. Okay? The, the tools to use and so forth. So you gotta, you got to have solutions. You know, you're, you're in, 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 provide a service. Like, let me tell you a story about one of my, I think most, what's the most successful uh, concept I've done. Mm -hmm. And I, I talk about what good has done for the world. And the rest of the business is one of my, one of my deals. But this was, a, I did this with some doctors. They came to me with an idea and I, I said, okay, I, uh, I looked at it and, and uh, it was a that little stent that they put in the, the heart stent. The heart stent. That's the right. The heart stent. Yeah. Okay. So right. I, I looked, told about it, by a cardiologist and, and a radiologist invented it, mm -hmm. and they said, "Why don't you talk to us? Because we have it. This, this radiologist, radiologist invented it. We brought it to some major companies. They foo fooed it, but I think it's, I think it's going to work. So I said, well, when you look at it, I said, okay. So I went, I went to the hospital." Went there, I took my accountants and my attorneys with me. Went there, looked at it. The two doctors were young guys, didn't have any money. So I listened to their ideas, saw all their tests, what they were doing, you know, the animal studies and that kind of stuff they did. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I said, I like this. And I said, I think I'm going to do it. My attorney said, don't do it. I lower you, my, uh, the, my <laughs> accountant said, no, don't do it. Accountant said, don't do it. My lawyer said, don't do it. I said, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it for the reason that, that everybody needs this. It's the need. Everybody has a heart. Everybody abuses it. There's no solution. If this thing provides a solution, it's going to be worth an awful lot of money. So I said, I'm going to do it. So I put $250,000 in it. Wow. And I said, I'll do this and I'll, I'll, own, I'll handle all the business part of it. Mm -hmm. I own 30% of it. The other doctors, the doctor did the you know, research and everything that they had to do and all. So anyway, we sold it to Johnson & Johnson. I had a, I sold it to Johnson & Johnson. They gave me $10 million uh, up front for the first year wow. to keep going with it, you know. So we did that. We met all our goals. And then we uh, put in for FDA approval. We got that, and Johnson & Johnson. I was able to negotiate the high, highest royalty ever with Johnson & Johnson, 10% royalty. Mm -hmm. And we had that for maybe six years, six, seven years, and they wanted to change it on us. We we made about seven hundred million dollars in our company. That's incredible. Which I had thirty percent of. Right. right. And then they, so they wanted, we gave them the rights to the patent. We didn't give them the, the patent. So they came back and said, well, "We want to we want to buy the patent." Then I said, "Okay." We negotiated that. We got another five hundred million dollars for the patent. You know, it's like, like that, and that was just two hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Now, and we got about. You think about it. That was one of the reasons. The other reason why I did it one because it's such a, you know, gratifying deal. Some doctors, of some guys up in California came to me and said, "We want to do a movie on this." Talk to my partner because one of them has mm -hmm. a winery out there, and and I said, "What do you mean? What's the?" Big, big deal about a stent. He says, you know how many people have a stent in them? This was last year. I said, how many? 60 million people. Incredible. You saved, you Since saved, your God, six, yeah. I got three of them in me. 
You saved your own life. Yeah, I saved my own life. <laughs> wow. You, got, you saved more people with your stent, stent since you were alive than wars have killed people. Incredible. That's wild. So, you say, what, what do I get my satisfaction out of? That. It served something. It did something. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's what I'm most proud of and, and, and going forward. But it, it you know, it, it gives me satisfaction and gratification for, for, for doing something like that. But another thing, too, I think was important is, is one of the reasons why I did it at the time, I, I just gotten out of Fuddruckers and I had a bunch of money to you know, invest in other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. And I put the $250,000 in it, but then the, the government allowed you to write it off. Okay. So I could write it off. If it didn't work, I write it off. It yeah. had $250,000 worth of taxes. <laughs> I could write it against the taxes. So I said, okay, so it's a win-win deal. Today, you can't do that. So you don't get that money from the general public to put in anything. So it's time that kind of that kind of opportunities. And I have to say that is so much of why I appreciate the book because it shows how you think and how you look at the world. Like you mentioned, even just breaking down the business opportunity for the stent, everyone has a, everyone has a heart, everyone has a problem, right? Why not do this deal? And that, even though we come from very different businesses, I was able to relate that to different things that I have done and that is exactly what I got from this book. So I am curious though, Phil, this show is called The Pathways to Success. It's about interviewing leaders about their journeys to success and teasing out what have they done to achieve these results. But if there was one thing about you or the way that you've conducted your life that you think you've done uniquely different than others to do what you have done in your career, what do you think that is? I think, I think focus. Focus. No, I don't. I don't do two. I, I, I don't start another deal until I finish the one I'm with. Okay. Okay. I mean that's like. Um, you know, you don't have two wives. You finish with one, <laughs> get a divorce, <laughs> you go on and get another one. But but anyway, it, the same thing with with, with 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 business. You just can't do two things. You can't. You can't. You got to put 100% of your time into it. Right. So they can't. They can't be sacrificing it. Put put 100% of your time in that too. But again, no matter what it is. It's got to solve a problem. Right. And, you know, before I did um, the stent, I just got done with Fuddruckers. Mm -hmm. And that was a lesson in, in finding a reason to do something. You know, I saw Fuddruckers, and what made me want to do Fuddruckers is McDonald's, okay? I mean, when I went to college, that quarter pounder, great product. It still is. Mm hmm you know, quarter pounder. Wow, I lived on it in college. And it's remained the same. It's still the same. Ten years after I got out of college, that quarter pounder was the same. But wasn't the same. What wasn't the same about it was the price. Mm. They were charging three times more for it, and they didn't make their product better. <laughs> I was getting the same product, paying three times more. I said, I got I to gotta make a better product and charge more for it. Take the milkshakes out and put the beer in there. <laughs> okay. An adult. Get these kids out of it. You know, yeah. make an adult hamburger. Because adults grew up in hamburgers. Now they want an adult hamburger. Okay, there's always that need. Mm -hmm. Need for a better hamburger. And then McDonald's had a crink in their ar armor, not, not making it better. Because it's out of opportunity. So I got into it, you know, and that, then we got it. And I, mean, I broke it into five parts, the hamburger. Did you remember Fud Ruckers? Mm -hmm. Five parts. The meat, grind my own beef. Buns, bake my own buns, you know, cook them on a black iron griddle away, you know, so you could c control the heat. Mm -hmm. Produce area, put what you want to put on it. And then the cheese, the melted cheese and all that stuff. And the place you eat it in, you got to look at all this stuff all around you. You see the baked buns being baked, the meat being ground up, hamburger being cooked, all the produce you put on it. You know, what do you, that's, that's that world. The world of making the world's greatest hamburger. And bingo, there you go. And that was the idea. I yeah. love that. Uh, Phil, we have some folks tuning into the live stream. Anthony Sasaga, I believe that uh, he worked for one of your companies before. He is uh, saying hello, and he thinks that you are, um, Phil is the only person in the restaurant history that's created more than two national concepts. He's in Dallas, uh, and he's showing a lot of uh, love and respect to you here. And, of course, Larry North, uh, <laughs> previous guest on the show, wants to say hello to you as well. So, Good. Phil, I want to close on a final topic here. And... Um, I really didn't know what to think about this. I felt so weird when I read this. Uh, Kim Davis, who, by the way, if Kim is watching, she's amazing. She is a gem oh, who yeah. has been giving me so much <laughs> incredible access to you. So thank you, Kim, if you're watching. Um, 
But Phil, you said you're thinking about phasing out of business and thinking yeah. about your future now moving forward. So where do you want to start with that? What is, what is left for you to do? Well, what's left for me to do is enjoy the, the fruits of my labor. Yeah. You know, I've, um, I've got a son, and he's, um, I'm phasing him in. I'm mm -hmm. phasing myself out. <laughs> yeah. He goes to all my meetings with me. He's there all the time. He's educated. He went to Syracuse University, played lacrosse up there. He's, he's, he's you know, he's a, he's a fighter. He's, he knows what he wants, you know, unless he's got that desire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, he goes to all my meetings with me. He understands what's happening. Yeah. I, 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 I did my estate planning and all that stuff and had him involved so he understands it, what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and so forth. And like I said before, I admit, I made my charge during technology, when there wasn't no technology. Mm -hmm. Null and void of technology. You just do it. Use your head and different ideas and whatever they had out there. They didn't have computers back then. First computer I remember out there was all these cards they had, remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and IBM machines there. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, now I don't, I was too busy doing things. I, I didn't have time to learn it. Mm -hmm. So I had to hire people to do it. So what am I going to do now? Well, I'm an artist. You know, I got, I do art. Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is phase out of everything, turn everything over to my people go out there and do something they can't do. Mm -hmm. And that's my art. And I feel good about myself. So I'm going to phase out, turn everything over to them, go do my art, and live happily ever after. And that's it. So, well, first off, I, I'm actually curious. Where does your art live? Is there anywhere online that we can check that out? Or it's in your head? OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's online. Yeah, I got a. Yeah. At the Samuel Lynn Gallery, mm -hmm. it's the gallery we have. And, uh, my name, Google my name, I got my art, I think. And we can check it out. So, Phil, when you're looking back at your entire career and you see, like, what you've done, how do you personally define a life well-lived? I think tired. What's that? I'm tired. You're tired? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think life well-lived, I think, um, well, I look back and I think about the good things that I've done, just like that, the heart stent, yeah. all those people, that wouldn't, they wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. Or they're gone now, probably, but but when when they have that extra life to them, including myself, I save my own life by making an investment, the right kind of investment. Mm -hmm. um, I think about the things that affected me, my family, my and in uh, the world. Yeah, I love. You know, it's like, like I wanted to make the world a different place than it was Madness. when I got here. Make a difference. Make a difference. Right. Make it a different place. Make a make a, a difference in the world. Phil, it is always a pleasure to have you on the show. If you would share our audience how to check out the book, how to follow anything else that it is that you're doing right now, if you would tell us all that. Well, I guess I Google. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, that's not my. I don't know how. You, we'll leave a link we'll below. Leave the book. It's yeah, just it, on Amazon. Amazon also the website. Right. Uh, for sure, we'll we'll make sure to to have. Get all hold that of Kim. Done, she'll so. tell you. But we'll go with Kim also. Yeah, we'll make sure to have all that information plugged in the show notes. Phil, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much for okay, coming on the show. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And everyone else, thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Pathways to Success. As always, make sure to subscribe, comment, and share. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Pathways to Success.